hello everybody uh, here in the room and at the screens. Um, this is the public keynote lecture from the um, Spring Academy Spaces of Financialization and Definancialization. And uh, my name is Matthias Bernd. I'm working here at the Leibniz Institute for Research on Society and Space. Um, and I'm happy to announce uh, Manuel Albers keynote lecture and uh, to introduce uh, the talk and also to guide you through the program. A few words on, on Manuel, uh, who's going to hold this keynote lecture. And we're very grateful uh, for him to come here and be with us and to give this talk. For those of you who are in the financialization literature, who are familiar with it, and I think that's most people in the room, um, introducing Manuel is sort of of carrying codes to Newcastle. Um, Manuel, I think, is, is a key figure, if not the fig key figure, of financialization studies in the last decade or so. Uh, he is a professor of human geography at the uh, University of Leuven in Belgium, um, where he leads a research group on the intersection of real estate, finance, and state, uh, which has been funded by the ERC, by the European Research Council. Uh, he's published a tremendous amount of volumes, papers, uh, books, edited volumes on the matter of financialization, uh, among them Place Exclusion and Mortgage Markets by Wiley Blackwell, 2011, uh, The Financialization of Housing, a Political Economy Approach, um, and Subprime Cities, the Political Economy of Mortgage Markets, also Wiley Blackwell. Um, and in addition, uh, quite a couple of seminal papers which are highly cited and made it as key um, articles that many researchers in urban studies and financialization refer to. Um, so we are very happy to have him here. In addition, Manuel is not only active in publishing and study and researching, but also you know, in supporting research uh, through his uh, work as associate editor of the Encyclopedia of Urban Studies. He's the editor in chief of the Geography Journal, and I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrongly, it's Dutch, it's the Tateschrift for Economisk and Soziale Geografie or something like that, T-E-S-G for the English speakers. Um, but he is also on the board of, of other journals, Transactions of the Institute of British Geographers and on others. I just cut that list um, before it gets too long. Um, tonight, Manuel is going to speak about uh, the colonization of life, world, and system by finance. Um, and I think what he tries to do is to take a Habermasian approach and to use it for the for, for the for making sense of uh, financialization in a broader perspective. Um, that's all I can say for the moment. Um, Manuel will most likely speak for 45 minutes, and then we have another half an hour or so for questions and answers and discussions, and I will moderate that then. So, Manuel. Um, Thank you for being with us, and uh, the floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you very much, Matthias. Um, yeah, thanks for the water also, that's great. Uh, I was just gonna thank Stefan also for, for organizing my stay here because I've been on a sabbatical. So this is uh, towards the end of my sabbatical. So I've been here for two months and staying for another uh, week or so. So uh, um, yeah, thanks to the IRS, to Oliver, to Matthias, to Stefan for organizing in different ways and at different levels. Um, I hear a bit of an echo. Is this too close? Is it just the echo? Here? Is this fine? Okay. I don't know if it's fine for the recording too, but let me know if people are complaining that they can't hear me. Um, so thanks for those people hosting me and making this possible. I'm happy to speak here. I'll, you'll be seeing more of me in the coming week. I also wanted to say to the seven people who signed up for the one-on-ones, um, probably most of them will plan on Thursday. Um, because tomorrow morning I'm going to use first to read your one pages, or in Alberto's case, his seven pages, but the other people have sent one page, but I'll be, uh, I'll be reading those to get a little bit up to speed of what you're working on, and then we'll use the breaks, and then I think at first day the program ends at 4.30, so we'll have a bit of time afterwards as well, so I'll try to get 20 to 30 minutes for everyone to do that. Uh, then some apologies about the presentation. I, I, I normally tell students, both undergraduate, graduate students, PhD students, to make the presentations attractive, not to write too many words on their slides. And um, usually this is not a standard apology I do, 
but the, the nature of the topic is such that it's not very visible. The other part is that um, I'm literally still in the process of, of developing this in my mind, which usually means that I need more work so my PowerPoint to make, make sense of it for myself. Whereas when I really know my own presentation, the keywords I put on are just there for the audience. Now a lot of that is actually for me because I, I need to hold on to it. So I have also my own notes here. Um, but this is basically the presentation plus a few other things. So it's, it's visually speaking, or it's not the best presentation. So I apologize for that. The advantage is that it's a very light file that will probably very easily go also for the online viewers of the presentation because I think it's like 20 kilobytes or something like that. So it's, it should go very smooth. Um, Matthias was just telling me in an earlier break that uh, he remembered that I was doing a presentation where I said that I was going to skip the theory so I would have time to discuss other things and I just did that like in 30 seconds I just placed myself I won't be able to do that today because it's going to be a lot about theory and I'm not sure how familiar everyone is with the work of Habermas so yeah the first part of the presentation is basically about uh, saying what Habermas has said First, I'll start with a little bit about financialization, why I think we need to come up with something else right now. But then the next five bullet points are basically about the work of Habermas and some of his key concepts. Uh, it's risky to also to do that in Germany, where I think the work of Habermas is still much more known than elsewhere. I think in a lot of places he's quite out of fashion. Um, but I have been told sometimes by older colleagues, uh, sometimes retired colleagues, that I'm uh, often dragging out sort of old-fashioned uh, social scientists uh, that are no longer in fashion. Uh, not necessarily bringing them back into fashion, but at least giving them a little bit of space. And then the last four bullet points here you see will be more about what can we do about this with financialization. Um, if you were expecting a talk about housing and financialization, this is not it. And uh, there will be, I think, two minor references to something on housing, maybe more slip in because often I say things that are not in my notes. Uh, so maybe I will say more about housing than I plan to. But this is not a presentation about housing. It's not a presentation about urban financialization either, although there will also be a few references to that. But that's more when I seek examples, I seek the examples close to my, you could say, my disciplinary home. Uh, so that's all the sort of the preamble. This is what I will be discussing in the next 40 minutes or so. So let's get started. Um, so financialization. I think now if you, if you read a paper on financialization, what it very often starts with is that it's the three schools, three strands, three theories of financialization. That has become quite a, kind of standard now. The funny thing is when I wrote my first paper in 2008, that was already a standard reference. So 15 years ago, uh, when I wrote that paper, people already talked about these three strands of financialization. So it's become very worn. Uh, people also cite recent papers for coming up with these three strands, but they're already quite common by the time why I actually wrote it in 2007, got published in 2008. So yeah, this, this still holds to some extent. I'm not saying it's completely invalid, but something has happened in the meantime um, where I don't know how useful it still is to talk about financialization of regime of accumulation as the rise of shareholder value and of daily life. Yes, it's one way to organize the financialization literature, um, but it's, it's by, by no means the only one. Uh, already in the paper by Pike and Pollard, I think uh, also around 15 years old, I think they had something like 20 themes in the financialization literature. Uh, in an earlier uh, piece, an encyclopedia piece, I first is, uh, came up with 10 themes, then in a later version with seven. So there's many other ways to do this, and I'm not saying there's definitely seven or there's definitely 10. I'm just saying you can do it in many ways and the one is not necessarily better than the other. So if you look at this financialization literature, you see, especially some of the, uh, the early literature coming already from the nineties, it's very much Marxist or Marxian. Um, I was confused who calls something Marxist, who called something Marxian. So I found I just used them both and then hopefully I don't get in too much trouble. So you see this very broad, this includes regulation theory, uh, relying on the work of Ariki, Braudel, Harvey. So some of these people who are basically, you know, self-proclaimed sometimes Marxist, but sometimes not the orthodox Marxist within the view of other Marxists. Um, so it's not necessarily the hardcore Marxism view that does these kinds of things. Then we also get Foucauldian views that became much more popular. Uh, post keynesian ones, especially in non-mainstream economics and heterodox economics, post keynesian views are much more popular than the Marxist views. 
Uh, and then you, you start seeing also in the last 10 years, already a little earlier, but it becomes more important in the last 10 years, more post-structuralist approaches and things loosely related to it. So actor network theory um, as well, cultural economy in very broad terms becomes part of what inspires this literature as well. So I think this has brought us much, a lot of interdisciplinary dialogue, uh, lots of connections also between micro and macro, people really doing research on financialization at a very small level, at the level of one firm or household. Uh, so sometimes quite fine-grained case studies. There's sometimes a critique that it's all about big macro processes. Well, yeah, that's part of the literature, but I think there's another part of the literature that really goes into the nitty gritty uh, of financialization. And I think there's a fair amount of papers also that try to make those connections. Or papers that are very much firmly in either the more micro studies or the more macro studies, but are aware of their connections. And even though empirically they rely on one part, they try to make the connections to other parts. So I think this has brought us much, um, especially in a dialogue between political e economics, uh, broadly defined, including non-mainstream economics, uh, geography, sociology, anthropology, political science, cultural studies, and there's probably, this is not an exhaustive list, there's probably other ones. And I think we've had a lot of empirical advancement also. Uh, you now have studies on many aspects of financialization. We have them in many countries. As a reviewer, I often get papers and that say like, oh, financialization is something being discussed in North America and the UK or in the Western world, but not somewhere else. I don't think this is true. I think especially if we look, there we come in the housing and the urban context, actually the US doesn't have a lot of financialization studies. It's actually not so much considering the size of the country. If you look more in urban and housing studies, the two biggest countries I would say of financialization studies are China and Brazil. That's where a lot of empirical studies are being done and some conceptual studies as well. Um, so it's no longer the case that this is a Western thing if it ever was, uh, maybe in the nineties as well when it was a very marginal literature, but it seems to be uh, a global North or a Western literature for at least 10 years. Um, so I think that's no longer the case. There is really financialization in many places uh, that's being documented or at least being studied. Also in many different sectors of the economy, but also many different aspects of social life. Uh, it would be hard to come up with a topic and then do a Google search and find that there's nothing at all on it. Uh, so yeah, that doesn't mean there's no more room to do more empirical studies. I mean, things also change, connections can be made, but it seems that there is maybe not a point of saturation, but a point of, okay, where are we going from? here? And I feel that conceptually speaking, if I have to summarize the debate, I go back very much to what was 10 years ago and less so much how this has developed in recent years. If I just want to give an overview of the debate. Once you want to get into the details, I think you start to rely much more on present studies and very recent studies. But I think uh, there might be a reason to take a step back and to yeah, reconsider some of these questions. So I came up with Habermas. Uh, I'm not a Habermasian. Uh, I'm also not presenting necessarily a completely Habermasian take on financialization. What I'm suggesting is that some of the concepts of Habermas could help us to rethink what financialization is and how different strands of financialization actually hang together. Uh, so I'm not suggesting that the whole analysis is based on Habermas. I very selectively take elements from Habermas analysis. And throughout the presentation, I'm also trying to connect them to other social sciences. Also to take the views of Habermas in itself is quite challenging because Habermas uh, to put it um, in not a very subtle terms, it's, it's kind of all over the place in the way that he's been inspired in his own work. So let's look a little bit at Habermas's work. So if we look at one central concept in Habermas's work, it would be communicative action. Um, and this is related also to rationality. This is one of the other key concepts in his work. And those concepts, like often with the big people who, people who do big theory, um, are not necessarily how we understand them. So communicative action to him has to do with cooperative, cooperative action undertaken by individuals based upon mutual uh, deliberation and argumentation. And he suggests that there's some sort of level playing field. So this is also one of the main critiques of the work of Habermas, people saying, well, there isn't really a level playing field. So communicative action, it sounds nice that it has to be deliberate and based on argument, arguments, but some people's arguments are gonna be stronger. And you could summarize that more briefly by saying uh, knowledge is power in Foucault's term, that could be a very short critique of his work. 
as we will see later, it is actually a little bit more complicated what Habermas suggests about communication and rationality. Uh, one of the things here for the basics is that for him, communication, uh, action, and rationality are in a way all related. And he finds human rationality uh, anchored through language. So I, I mentioned Wittgenstein as one of his influences. This is where Wittgenstein's influence is quite important. And what comes out of this communicative action is that it establishes social norms and that are then acted upon, which are not stable. They could be temporarily stable, but they're always undergoing change. So there's always a constant redefinition of these social norms. Uh, there's always a rethinking, a rekindling uh, of, of what that means because communicative uh, action uh, and communicative rationality are not end terms. They are in a way very active processes. But what Habermas tries to do with his theory of communicative action is to come up with a comprehensive theory of societal evolution and modernization, which of course are massive things. And therefore it's almost necessary that I pick just some small parts of it. He is influenced and built on the work of a whole range of people. And these are just some examples to show how diverse they are. Adorno, Kant, Hegel, Weber, Marx, Durkheim, Wittgenstein, I've already mentioned him, Meat, uh, Parsons, uh, Dewey, so pragmatism, and there's a whole range more of names that influence him. Like once I started rereading again, I was like, oh yeah, here he's referencing this person, or I forgot about this. Uh, so yeah, there's much more to this. And why is this the case? Because Habermas is trying to do something which is not necessarily uncommon in social theory, uh, but it's very difficult to do, which is something that's sometimes known as paradigm combination. He is trying to bring together what is sometimes called actions theory and systems theory, uh, sometimes also referred to as agency and structure, which are not the same thing. Uh, and sometimes people also reduce it to micro and macro, which again are different terms, but trying to give a little bit of the flavor of different kinds of theories, different kinds of empirics in a way, also trying to bring them together. Um, so what he's arguing is that we need to bring this analysis of systems together with the analysis of agency of micro processes and, and things like that. And he's suggesting that there's a hermeneutic approach um, where there is very much the view on the insider, the more micro level, but that this excludes an outsider viewpoint. And he says often the outsider is, is not even considered so much. It's just taken for granted or it's almost seen as if it's not that important. Well, actually, the outsider has quite, a, quite an influence on, on what happens on the micro level. And at the same time, what has happened, what is lost in the systems approach is more the internal perspective of the actors on the ground. So we, we've seen this discussion in many ways. That's why I put the terms micro or macro there, which is not, not really his terms. Agency and structure, there's all these theories to write it, bring these things together. You could say Bourdieu tries to do similar things. Uh, Giddens tries to do similar things. So a lot of, you could say, the great social theorists of the 20th century, some of them still alive in the 21st century, have tried to do this or still trying to do this. And this is, this is a big thing uh, about how to bring these together. Um, so another important point about Habermas is that for him, the Enlightenment is an unfinished project. Uh, and in this sense, he takes a quite uh, anti-post-structuralist view here. The post-structuralists, you could say, to some extent, they're trying to say the modernist project that came out of the Enlightenment has been a failure and we need to break it down. Whereas Habermas is saying, we're at a point where we need to rebalance and we need to bring other elements into it. But in the end, the Enlightenment, going back to Kant, also is some of the things that are the only things that bring us hope otherwise. Right? He doesn't say it's chaos, but there's, there's a bit of a suggestion. So he's arguing that society must come to terms with power, with money and embed them in society. And there's a parallel here to Polanyi, who's, who's much more popular again in recent years. Polanyi is a idea of re-embedding and the pendulum swinging back uh, also. Am I already causing you headaches, Matthias? No, okay, good. I just saw you, I was like, oh man. I just, Good. Um, so before I talk about the central concepts of life, world, system, and colonization, a little bit more about one of Habermas's ideas that I think is very often lost in the discussions, something he's not often cite, cited for, which are his ideas about advanced and late capitalism. And he defined this in the 70s, so keep in mind that something has changed in the meantime. I will get back to some of the things that have changed. 
But if you see the list, you might also recognize some things that are actually quite, quite good descriptions still of, of contemporary capitalism. So he talks about the concentration of industrial activity in a few large firms, and he doesn't uh, mean by industrial activity manufacturing, but the sectors of the economy. Um, then he talks about the constant reliance on the state to stabilize the economic system. So very similar to some Marxists and to the broader political economy literature. And then he discusses a formally democratic government that legitimizes the activities of the state and dissipates opposition to the system, uh, which could work with, with some other perspectives as well. And legitimization is, is a key term here as well in his work. It's something that comes back a lot. Legitimization crisis, um, again, sometimes associated with other people, is very much associated with Habermas's work from the 70s as well. And then he talks about the use of nominal wage increases to pacify the most restless segments of the workforce. Well, just as a spoiler, I, I think the, the last one is less true today than the other ones, but I think to some extent, the first three are still quite, ring, ring still quite true today. Uh, but yeah, what he's describing here, we could describe as Fordism a la Habermas or welfare state capitalism. So you could take also different perspectives here again and bring those together. Um, okay, then back to the life world. So as I already suggested, this is this more micro view and he builds a lot here on phenomenological sociology. Hüsner shoots, meets, um, and he takes this a little bit different than some of these phenomenological social theorists. So Hüsner is thinking of the life world, uh, he conceived of the life world, sorry, as a universe of what is self-evident or given. This to Habermas is not enough, so he goes a little bit further and he starts with the idea that this is an internal perspective, internal to a community, but to some extent internal also to individuals. But what he's coming up with, and this is again about this communicative action, is that there's intersubjectivity. So to him, the goal here of communicative action in the life world is not to come up with some objective truth. It's not to come up with some neutral outcome. It's the idea to come up with an intersubjective meaning intersubjective values that are to some extent shared between people. At some point he goes into a little bit about the differences here. I'm not gonna discuss those, but he suggests that there is some sort of intersubjectivity within this life world. Although this is also being attacked as we will see later. Uh, and then one way he discusses this is the lift realm of informal culturally grounded understandings and mutual accommodations. And what is important here, values, I already mentioned them, and those values develop through face-to-face -face context over time in social groups. So this gives diffused perspectives of local cultures. This means that there's differences between different cultures. This means that there's differences between places. There's also a different levels of analysis, you could say that. Um, you, could, you could think of this also as what old school between parentheses anthropologies used to describe and decode sort of the local community. Uh, of course, this is still alive and kicking. That's why I say old school between parentheses, because people are still trying to decode what happens in different life worlds. Um, and then those ideas coming up from the life world are mediated through the process of linguistic communication. So linguistic uh, comes back again, the influence of, of Wittgenstein, according to the rules of, and then we have one of the key concepts again, practical or substantive rationality. Uh, so this is not how people often define rationality. This is one much more, again, intersubjective, based again on communal values, not necessarily an objective one. Habermas doesn't suggest that all, rational, all rationality is objective. There's a, a rationality that comes, in a way, from the society itself, and that doesn't need to be objective. And I found some parallels here while we're reading it with what in economic geography now is often discussed, the tacit knowledge, which seems to be quite similar, actually, to how uh, Habermas discusses substantive rationality. And for Habermas, the focus here is much more on communication, whereas for earlier uh, phenomenological sociologists, it was about consciousness. Uh, so the consciousness is not something Habermas is particularly interested in, um, but it's something that yeah, um, Habermas says communication is here important. And in the life world, it's where he assumes some level of a level playing field. So here you could say he doesn't take power as knowledge a la Foucault very seriously. And we could still argue that, of course, in the life world, there's still differences between people and the power they have and how they can mobilize this power and how they can influence language and therefore also the values. Uh, 
but we could still criticize Habermas for, for ruling this out. As you will see in the next slide, that doesn't mean that power plays no role in the program. And rereading this, I was reminded also of the idea of social space from the Fever. Again, someone much more popular currently in geography or in urban studies already for 20 or 30 years, I think. Le Fevre has been a bit more popular than Habermas. Uh, but if we think of Giddens also, uh, it's what Giddens calls the more traditional system. And I think Habermas refuses this word traditional because it has a certain baggage to use the word traditional, while Habermas would argue that this is the de facto existing uh, society uh, and it doesn't necessarily need to be traditional. So then the system, this is about formal or instrumental rationality sometimes also discussed as technical rationality. And this is the part of rationality that comes much closer to how Max Weber defines rationality. When Max Weber talks about more purposeful rationality, it's rationality with a goal. It's one that, that pretends to be objective. Uh, it doesn't mean it's objective. So that's, that's one important difference here is that rationality in the life world is intersubjective. In the system, it's pretending to be objective, but not necessarily so. But these are different forms of rationality. Um, but in the system, this formal or instru instrumental rationality governs, governs systems of instrumentality. Again, words that are quite popular today, but in a way also go back to, to Habermas again. Um, and when we talk about the system, some examples he gives are industries, so a large economic sector, uh, the capitalist economy at large, so at an even higher level of analysis, the judiciary or, or the state. So um, yeah. You could, you could see it in a more smaller term or in a very big term, the state, the capitalist economy, or we could say the one industry or the judiciary is already a little bit more precise. The importance here is that the ideas are mediated according to the rules of that system. So in a way, there's not one system. There are systems, we could say, because he makes quite some uh, distinctions between how the system works for the administration uh, for the state, the judiciary on the one hand, and for economic sectors and the capitalist economy on the other. They don't have the same logic. They don't have the same formal or instrumental rationality. They also de uh, uh, depend between sectors. Um, so it comes much closer here also to the idea of Foucault that power is knowledge, um, because power plays a much bigger role in the system in a way uh, than it plays in Habermas' idea of the life world. So it's not a level playing field here. Um, so you could say the critique of Habermas is less valid here because in the system he, he does acknowledge it quite a bit that this is that, that power and knowledge are related. Uh, and what is important here that the system always has its roots in the life world, but ultimately, ultimately develops its own characteristics. So the state starts to develop its own characteristics, but so do economic sectors, so does the capitalist system at large. And these structures evolve, and as they evolve, they become more distant from the life world. Uh, they sort of try to disembed from the life world, to use Polanyi's language again, uh, and then yeah, start to lead a life of their own, with their own logics, their own uh, instruments, their own rationality. So again, we could compare here to both Lefebvre and Giddens. So it's what Lefebvre would call abstract space. I'm not saying it's one-on-one -on -one the same, but they're similar terms, which for Lefebvre is the constitutive of the capitalist mode of production, which includes the world of commodities and the power of money and that of the political state. Um, so in Levavre, it's, it's very much the state is there in a way for the capitalist economy, whereas Habermas keeps them uh, a little bit more separate, although he, he understands that the one is supporting the other one. In uh, Levavre's work, they are much more that the state is almost submitted to the capitalist economy itself. And, and this is what also uh, in Giddens' works is discussed as expert systems. And what is important is that rationalization is sometimes understood uh, to mean that this is the system taking over the life world. This is not rationalization to Habermas. Rationalization to Habermas takes place in both life worlds and system. There are different processes of rationalization. So just rolling out sort of a rational thinking in the life world coming from the system is not what he means by colonization. Rationality has its own process in both life, world, and system, but they're built on different types of rationality. Then this colonization of the life world is, uh, is the idea that these systems grow self-sufficient, they grow in power, as I said in, the, in some somewhat different words, uh, words in the slide before. And then what is important is that the system becomes the exercise steering capacity over the life world. 
So even though the system has its roots in the live world, as it becomes more independent and starts to develop its own logic, its own instruments and its own rationality, it has a steering capacity over the, over the live world. And we can find this through corporate, corporate, corp, sorry, corporate capitalism. There's too many difficult words in this presentation. Through corporate capitalism, but also through the welfare states, through reunification and through mass consumption. These are some of the key examples he has. There are other ones. And what is here going on is a rationalization of public life according to the rationality of the system. So again, not just the rationalization of the life world itself, but a rolling out of formal and instrumental rationality in the domain of substantive rationality, uh, whereby the formal and the instrumental try to take over and try to become leading in the life world, even though that clashes with how the life world itself is organized. Then finally, a quote from Habermas, when stripped of the ideological veils, the imperatives of autonomous subsystems make their way into the life world from the outside like colonial masters coming into a tribal society and force a process of assimilation upon it. I pick this quote also to, to make it clear that this is the idea of the colonial here, that he takes that quite literally uh, and makes a comparison with colonialism quite purposefully. And he suggests then that the system reduces the life world to something functional, something narrow, something that has to be useful. Um, and Therefore, the inherent values of the life world are not necessarily recognized through the system. You could say the values of the life world are being reduced to what their value is to the system, rather than what their value is to the life world itself. Um, then what we see is that the material reproduction of the system becomes the dominator symbolic reproduction of the life world. Again, meaning that uh, these values, the rationalities of the system are becoming dominating in how the life world is being organized. So you could say the system tries to reorganize how the life world works, but it can never fully do it. So it doesn't mean that there's some end point where the whole life world has become systemized or colonized. This is always only possible to some extent. Um, and again, we can see some parallels here with the work of others. So if we start with Giddens, he talks of penetration of abstract systems into daily life. That already sounds like you can almost translate the word once on one one-on-one -on -one to colonization of the life world. And it's Polanyi's idea of the economy de being disembedded in a way of society. Although you could say Polanyi starts in a slightly different way with his take. So it's not a one-on-one. -on -one. With Giddens, you can say it's almost a one-on-one -on -one translation. With Polanyi, it's almost a, a parallel movement that describes similar things, but not exactly the same thing. And we can also think of the production of space in Marxism and in Lefebvre's work, but again, not a one-on-one -on -one translation. So then what are the consequences of colonization? Um, important again in Habermas' work is another concept which are media, which is not how we understand media. It's not a newspaper or the radio or Facebook. He speaks of media as things that mediate uh, and two important ones for him in the system, the quantitative media are money and votes. And why does he call them quantitative media? In simple ways, because you can count them. Sometimes in the work about quantification, I don't know if some of you have ever delved into that the social theories of quantification it gets very complex. Habermas' idea of quantitative is, is relatively easy. You can count it. You can count money, you can count votes. And he says, this doesn't work with the more qualitative media that dominate the life world, normally speaking, because those are values and you can't measure a value. Um, you can try to, to place one value over another one and saying it's more important, but you can't just put a number on it. So if you start to have a situation where these quantitative media like money and votes become to dominate the life world, that basically makes the life world quite one dimensional. Uh, thinking of the work of, of Herbert Marcuse, the, the father of urban planner Peter Marcuse. So it becomes very reductive to, to think in this way. Uh, and then instead of enhancing the capacity to communicate and reach understanding, the exertion of this external control threatens those processes. So communicative action actually breaks down through this quantitative media. And people's sense of legitimacy of fundamental institutions such as the government, the market, is in doubt. And here we have this legitimacy crisis again that we can have of politics, of capitalism, and that there's a whole range of responses we can get. One of them is populism. Another one is an anti-capitalist movement. It can also be the withdrawal of individuals or social groups from political and economic processes. 
uh, which then can lead to social exclusion. It can also contribute to a fracturing uh, of society or furthering existing uh, fracturing of society. Habermas suggested with uh, the, the colonization of, of the life world, also the life world tends to fall apart more in separate little communities that are no longer necessarily one community. And to Habermas, this is not always completely negative. To some extent, he's suggesting that some of this is necessary because the life world itself can be quite conservative. And sometimes it helps actually for the system to roll out some different forms of rationality. Uh, if we just think about things like, like gender or class, for instance, you know, big sociological concept. Well, we think sometimes in some life worlds, yeah, this wasn't always that great. So maybe some of this rationalization from another world sometimes was necessary. But if this happens sort of without the dialogue in the life world itself and is just pushed upon the life world, it's basically uh, doomed to fail, is what, what Habermas is suggesting. So although some of this influence from the system on the life world is natural and sometimes even needed. It always needs to be in dialogue with the life world and going to this communicative action rather than just imposing it on. Um, but yeah, in, in what happens once you have this legitimate crisis is that there's less space for communicative actions because relationships become mediated through money and through power. And then uh, Habermas quite explicitly refers to Marx's idea of alienation, false consciousness, and adds to that the idea of self-deception. And this is also why, especially in the US, Habermas is sometimes seen as a Marxist. While in Europe, this is very rare to see Habermas as a Marxist. But there is a clear influence of Marx. But as we've seen, there's an influence from Kant, there's an influence from Hüffler, from Adorno. So it's very weird to say like, oh, there's all these influence and there's Marx too, so he must be a Marxist. I would say, if we have to pick one, I would say maybe Weber is still somewhat closer, but that even would be a quite contentious claim already to say that he's a Weberian because in a way he's, he's just unique on its own. So then we go to finance and I'm suggesting here that finance could be a new paradigm. And that sounds like a big claim and I don't wanna make it bigger than it is, um, but I'll try to explain why I come with this idea of finance as a new paradigm. So, the modern between parentheses interaction and coordination through bureaucracies and states, a la Weber, as well as through money and markets, together the system in Habermas' wor uh, work, is at least to some extent a necessary response to deal with the search in complexity in societal development. So this is again important, like th the system is not something Habermas wants to get rid of. Habermas wants to, the system, the life world in a way to work together. Um, but then if we look at what's, how the system is being theorized and how it's being discussed, we see a number of ways. And I just discussed a few here. This is not an endless list. Uh, and then for Max Weber, the paradigm of the system is bureaucracy. You could say one of the things that Habermas is, uh, sorry, that Weber is most known for is his work on bureaucracy. And it was very much about the state and even in his work about uh, the economy and the state, you could say in a way, a lot of that was more about the state also than the economy. Uh, for George Richer, uh, who very much built on both Weber and Habermas, uh, the new paradigm became the fast food restaurant, what he call, called the McDonaldization of society. So in a way, uh, companies, but also society more widely speaking, becoming organized as it is at McDonald's. So um, the self-service idea of the restaurant, but also the way how you keep prices low, the splitting up in labor according to Taylorist principles, uh, also the idea of how uh, McDonald's could spread over the globe, largely by copying its model to other countries, but to some extent also allowing hybrids. In many countries, you can get some sort of local snack to McDonald's that's being influenced by a fast food snack from their own country. Um, so uh, Ritzer discusses a whole range of elements in which the fast food restaurants have become the paradigm, uh, you could say, for how the system works. And he discusses to a limited extent also how this rolls out into the organization of the state, into the care sector. So there's quite some interesting examples in Victor's work about how this happens. We could say in more implicit terms, uh, Emmanuel Castells' work, we can find this with the network and the network being in a way, a very specific form of the system. And then Castells uh, tries to put the network on one side and compares it to the self. Very interesting discussions you could have also with social media and things in mind now that weren't there yet when Castells first started to theorize the network and, and the opposition to the self. Uh, 
But to me, it's finance. And um, I'm not saying it's the only way to do it. It's the only paradigm possible. That's why I'm, I'm, I was a little bit hesitant to use the word paradigm. But as I saw like how the word paradigm was being used there to basically see how something is being organized according to the principles, according to the rationality, and according to the instruments of one specific thing. So in this case, what I'm arguing is that society is not just becoming financialized in the sense of financial actors rolling out, but society becoming organized according to the rationality and the instruments that are normally home to finance and foreign to other domains of society and even to other domains of the economy to some extent. So what is different here is that finance does not simply colonize the life world, it also colonizes the system. It colonizes the bureaucracy, the fast food restaurant, the network, and so on. In a way, you could say finance adds another layer to the theory, and to some extent makes the other layers, institutions, values, submit to it. This is not a totality. Uh, it's, it's not something where everything becomes dominated by the rules of, of finance. It's always partial. Um, and yeah, following Habermas, it's, it's only possible that it's, that it's partial because otherwise the whole system would fall apart. Uh, if the life world doesn't work anymore, the system also falls apart. And you could say in a way with colonialism, uh, the same was true as well. Um, on some specific places, colonialism could be a completely dominant system, but many colonized countries were only in fact partially colonized and often through all sorts of, uh, of, of levels of dependency in which the system, the colonizing power, didn't have full control directly, but often through all kinds of, of mediating institutions, thereby making the influence of the colonial very different in different places. We can, we can argue the same about the colonization of the system or about the colonization by finance. Uh, so this also creates new hybrids. It doesn't mean the same is happening all over the place. Uh, it has different forms, if you will. So this is a slide I added. Um, Quite, quite late, I think it was actually this morning when I just added an extra slide to, going back to the idea of late or advanced capitalism uh, and trying to reinterpret a little bit here what this could mean. If we go to Habermas's four general features and I'm adding one extra one from Ritzer, um, we can see that some of them still work quite well. Concentration of financial activity in a few large firms. Well, maybe if you look at the, at the economy at large, people tend to talk a lot about how things are less concentrated. But if you think of the financial sector itself, or if you think more broadly speaking of extractive industries like energy and mining, but following Saskia Sassen, also finance itself, we actually see that these tend to be sectors where the activity is very much concentrated in a few large firms. Uh, these can be transnational corporations, but they don't necessarily need to be transnational corporations. In finance, very often in many countries, uh, it's national institutions dominating the market, uh, and it's often a handful, and then there's many, many other ones, and there's, there's a level of development of different kind of elements, sort of a, an ecosystem of finance, but it's still often dominated by a few. Then I add one of the elements for, from Ritzer, which is the reliance on non-human technologies, and he describes this for McDonald's, but we could say, of course, this rings very true for finance as well, fintech being a popular example of the last few years, but we can also think of credit scoring, credit rating systems, artificial intelligence, high frequency trading, all these things rely very heavily on non-human technologies. Not exclusively, I'm not saying the humans aren't important there anymore, but what these non-human technologies do is diminishing even further the responses of the life world to the system, because in a way, the life world is pushed to the side, it makes it harder for the life world to to be in a dialogue with, with these non-human technologies. Um, one other element from Habermas that we can more or less keep as it is, is a constant reliance uh, on the state to stabilize the financial system. Um, this is something we have seen very well. I don't think this is a surprise for anyone who was uh, at least a teenager by the time the financial crisis hit in 2007, 2008, and this is still going on. Uh, and then another element from Habermas, I think that is still, um, yeah, very much true today. A formally democratic government that legitimizes the activities of the state and the financial sector and dissipates opposition to the system. I think we've seen that in many cases as well. Again, there's limits to this as well. It's not saying this is always in all ways the case in all ways the case. And then I think instead of wages keeping up, what we saw in the earlier phase of, of late uh, capitalism, 
um, where wage growth was a strategy in a way to keep the middle classes happy. I think now what we see is what Colin Crouch has called privatized Keynesianism in a paper from 2009, which is basically the idea that wage increases don't keep up. In many Western states in particular, wage increases don't keep up with inflation. They don't keep up with housing prices. They don't keep up with a lot of other uh, prices. So there becomes a reliance on housing as an asset, especially for the middle classes in a way to compensate. for this. So I, I assume many of you are familiar with the idea of privatized Keynesianism, so I won't go into too much detail. Uh, but I think this is one element that is very different in financialized capitalism to what we could say are earlier phases of what Habermas described of late or advanced capitalism. So what do we see in this financialized capitalism? We see a colonization of the life world by finance. This is what's suggested already in the title of my presentation. And this means a new form of formal or technical instrumental rationalization. It's not the same as the version of rationalization we saw before. It's a particular finance take on what this rationalization looks like. Finance is seeping deeper into the fabric of everyday life. Uh, and again, connecting to some existing literature here on, the finan on financialization, we can think of what uh, Jacob Hacker calls the great risk shift in which households uh, can rely less on public institutions for long-term security and become dependent on financial institutions. So here again, there's a link also with this idea from Colin Crouch on privatized Keynesianism. It's no longer the welfare state. It's no longer the wage increase. Actually, it's the state making you more dependent on financial institutions. And then a quote from Randy Martin, uh, the person who, I don't know if he invented the term financialization of daily life, but he's definitely known for it. Quote, it asks people from all walks of life to accept risks into their homes that were at Herto, the province of professionals. So again, this idea that the professional rationalities from the financial sector are entering, you could say, households. Uh, or what Ellen and Pryke have called the redefinition of citizens into consumers. Uh, uh, parallel here with this idea of reductionism, the one-dimensional man of Herbert Marcuse uh, coming out from this view as well. So here we can think of the literature of the financialization of daily life. I already mentioned this very much talking about households, but I think there's an interesting sort of sub-literature there also on the workplace, how also financialization has made work different, has made work more calculable, there's fewer papers on this, but it's quite interesting as well to look at this. And there's also some papers on care work uh, and how this has become different uh, as well. And here we see this as a idea of calculability becomes very dominant. You could say the idea of calculability was already in the system, but gets an even narrower take on the financialization. Calculability is being reduced in a way to something you can count uh, in, in, in numbers that tend to be numbers of euros or dollars or a different currency. So even making this one dimensional man or one dimensional woman even sort of even thinner in this dimension. And if we think about the care sector, for instance, you know, the idea of counting hours because these hours are representing money uh, of private equity moving into the care sector, uh, but also the results of the quality of care actually going down, the quality of work going down. Can all relate this to, to this idea. So I picked my examples uh, on purpose less about households per se and a little bit more about this smaller literature on the financialization of care. Then we can also think of the financialization of the discourse, which is not really a term necessarily used, but this is how I try to bring together a few things where finance is used as a narrative, as a language uh, to assess all things economic and non-economic, thinking about things in terms of the money they represent, the value they represent, and reducing this value to economic value, and even narrower than that, reducing it to exchange value, because we could say use value is also economic, is also economic value. So, and even within exchange value, it tends to be the, the value of an asset. Uh, and we see this also if we combine the two first uh, little arrows about how people think about buying a house, for instance, that this becomes a lot more about future investment and the future wealth of the house and how people can resell it rather than I want to live in this house because this is where I like to live. But if we think of the economy, I don't want to say the whole economy, the whole is, is all in the, financialization of, uh, in the financialization of the system. In a way, part of the economy, I would argue, is in the life world as well. If we think of mom and pop stores, corner stores, uh, a lot of small uh, parts of the economy, sometimes the foundational economy, although I would say part of the foundational economy are in fact part of the corporate economy as well. 
part of the informal economy, although I put that here with a question mark because maybe I'm stepping a bit too far of my comfort zone. So I'm not much of a specialist on the informal economy. We could argue this to some extent being financialized as well. I, there's a few references on this, but I'm actually gonna write this down in a paper. I have to find a little bit more evidence for this claim. Uh, but this is what I have sometimes called the financialization of the economy with a minor. The economy sort of as day-to-day -day life of just going around uh, your business. Uh, then on the other hand, we have the colonization of the system by finance, which is a suggestion that within the system, finance was already dominant. Um, Habermas already mentions money as one of the ways in which the system's rationality works, but this is becoming even more dominant. So it's not in that sense, a radical break with Habermas. It, you can say this is almost Habermas in an overdrive where money as a rationality within the system becomes even more important. Um, where the formal and instrumental rationalization itself is being colonized by this thinner financial rationalization, which is flattening the existing rationality even further. The difference is that it could be argued that financial rationalization is not just threatening the life world, it is actually threatening the state and the market as well. And there's quite some interesting research, uh, especially in heterodox economics, that suggests also that a lot of the financialization isn't even good for uh, the capitalist economy, that it's actually breaking down the capitalist economy to some extent. Um, and therefore, it's not just about the corporate uh, economy doing what it always does in new ways, it's actually breaking some of it down. Um, states and public, semi-public institutions are increasingly also dependent on financial markets and are also evaluated in similar ways to firms, meaning that financial logics are taking hold in city hall to some extent. Um, governments being forced to some extent to do this in some ways also choosing to do this. And the first uh, arrow at the bottom there, the financialization of the state literature discussed this very much. And there's some authors in this literature who really see it as the state being taken over by the financial sector. But I think there's now more arguments saying the state is using also these financial instruments uh, and trying to use them in their own workings. So in this sense, the colonization might be sometimes a bit too strong of a metaphor because it's also the state to some extent choosing to do it. So I wanna take back a little bit here of the strong claim that the title suggests. Um, but this means also that public and semi-public institutions become managed like private firms, new public management literature, uh, you know, is, was trying to further this and then there's a whole critique of that. And that takes a new term also on the financialization. And this changes the organizational culture of local governments because there's a re redefinition of the social purpose of why the state is there to do anything. Uh, and we can compare this to what we discuss as the entrepreneurial and financialized urban governance term. And the entrepreneurial one is one and the financialized one, you could say comes on top of it. Um, so financialization of the state I already mentioned, but yeah, this also fits to the literature on the financialization of firms, but more firms as in companies on the stock exchange. Therefore the financialization of the economy with a capital E of the corporate sector of large companies, of transnational corporations. And then we get to the last two slides. Let's see how I'm doing time-wise, not too bad. Um, so the spaces of financialization, um, here we see that financialization has a spatiality. It happens at different scales. And I already discussed the idea that it spreads to different countries, a global spread of financial rationality of financial instruments. Again, this doesn't mean the same thing happens everywhere. Um, there's always some hybrids possible. Uh, and it also doesn't mean that within a country it spreads evenly. It's very likely, uh, and especially in more unequal societies, that you find uh, evidence of financialization much more in certain, in certain places in that country than in other places, or in certain sectors of the economies rather than in others. And you see sometimes these international comparisons and then it might look like, ah, oh, financialization isn't very much furthered. Uh, if we just compare countries on the same terms. But then actually, if we look at the literature and we look at specific elements, we see that countries like Brazil and China that I've mentioned before, if we look at the financialization of the state in some ways, that is a process that might be further along the lines there than in many Western countries. So the fact that financialization doesn't happen in one domain or not so strongly in one domain doesn't, doesn't mean it doesn't happen in another domain. So yeah, you get these hybrids with local culture, with local instruments, you get them spreading quite unevenly within countries. 
Um, so in this sense, it's not a pure form. Often then people compare like one idealized form of financialization or one idealized form of capitalism, very often the US, sometimes the Western world, but I don't think that exists. Uh, I don't think there is this one form of, of financialization, one key form of capitalism. There's always been many forms. And yeah, the US just has one form of financialization. And in some ways, sometimes more dominant than in other countries, in some ways less developed than in some other countries. So I don't think we should be comparing to some sort of idealized Western or American form, but rather seeing the actually existing forms of these spaces of financialization and comparing them to each other without some idealized example of, of what the Western or US form of it must be. So what we see here is that subjective information um, oh, sorry, I'm skipping one bullet point. Um, what is happening with these spaces of financialization is that we see a reproducing of hierarchical representations of space. Again, this idea of Habermas that things need to be calculable. So you need to be able to put a number on it. So the ratings, also the rating agencies give to countries. There's, there's a hierarchy in it and you can be higher or lower on that scale. And you cannot be on a different scale. There's just one scale in this sense. So subjective information must be objectified. That doesn't mean it's objective. It's made to seem objective, made calculable in order to create trust systems. Well, ironically, it is actually destroying existing systems of trust in the process. So we see a standardization of local contexts and the particularities of place and time. But again, this is in how the, the system fuels the life world. This is not necessarily the reality on the ground that this is being standardized. It's an idea that through the standardization, you can compare it that you can treat these places as more homogenous, you can treat them as more decontextualized, and therefore, in a way, as commodified places. It doesn't mean that those places are in all ways actually being standardized, being hegemonized, being decontextualized, et cetera, et cetera. But what it does mean is that it excludes the necessary role of local knowledge and expertise, to, to think of the work of James Scott, seeing like a state. Um, but what we see here is that it's furthering and deepening existing colonization, but with, I would argue, uh, a qualitative difference. And the qualitative difference, I think, here is most related to the state, as the state's instrumental rationality is reduced to a flat, one-dimensional financial market rationality. But again, this is also being contested, and this can never fully be the case. Uh, but this is why the state, I think, in a way, the financialization of the state here is a little bit more important, theoretically speaking, conceptually speaking, than the financialization colonization of the market system. So then we get to the very last slide, spaces of definancialization. And I wanted to refer, of course, also to the, the title of, uh, of the, the Spring Academy. Um, so first spaces of financialization, then spaces of definancialization. So I quote Habermas one more time. Money and power should be institutionally and motivationally anchored in the life world. This is what it, we could say it all goes back to. And what else is there on this slide goes back to this first sentence. And this again relates very much to Polanyi's idea that's now being more mobilized as a sort of encounter capitalist movements and his idea of the necessary embeddedness of markets in society. The live world, social space, as a space of resistance, of contestation, of auto question, of self management, of commoning, it stands here, communing, it should be commoning. Uh, of actually existing alternatives that are there. But this is always a very fragile balance. Uh, the foundational economy, other economies, uh, alternatives are always at risk of being financialized, capitalized, colonized. And here also, I thought it was interesting to think of the idea of Hart and Nagley of capitalist extraction of value from the common. So that there's always this risk when there is an alternative being developed in a way that, there's, that it's being subsumed, to use the Marxist term, but in the way that Hart and Nagley used rather than in the way that Marx used it himself. And I think one prime example here being today the, the sharing economy, which has basically become a rolling out of capitalist financialized logics to the alternatives that were originally developed against, you could say, capitalism. Um, and this is what Dahlberg has called a cyber libertarian impulse uh, taking place in how to do this. But in a way, it goes back to this capitalist extraction of value from the company. But to Habermas, the modernist projects, the Enlightenment is not finished, which is why we should always go back to this first quote. Uh, and Habermas, in the end, is quite hopeful. He's more hopeful, I would say, than, than some uh, of his contemporaries and some of our contemporaries. 
He's hopeful that the re rebalancing is possible, uh, but he's also arguing that the rebalancing is a constant struggle. The Enlightenment is not a finished pro uh, project. It's something that always needs to go on. It's constant work to actually uh, anchor uh, money and power in the West. Thank you very much. Thanks, Manuel, for this enlightening talk. Um, I think there was a lot of food, uh, food for thought, not food for thought, but food for thought. Um, now the floor is open to questions, discussions, feedback, and I think we have something of 20 to 30 minutes left, maybe 20. Um, so I just say we collect questions as they come. And if people in the internet have questions, uh, they post them using the comment function. Okay, I, I go back to my seat over there and just see if I can now wave my finger to people. Sabina, I think you were first. Uh, you were first. <laughs> Besides, you are guest here. Oh, thank you, Manuel. That was quite a contrasting program to my entire morning where I was in a hiring committee for an economist. And a lot of neoclassic or classical economic approaches and so on. So I'm actually very thankful for this uh, inspiring tool and, and a lot of food for thought, as you said. And I'm actually also grateful that you put a lot of information on your slides because otherwise I would have been overwhelmed. So um, just to get, I mean, obviously there was a lot of, you know, information and and for me it's just like a lot of fundamental clarifying you know first remarks perhaps um could you just a bad question but i put it bluntly but why are you doing this exercise could you perhaps <laughs> you know, it's it's no, i wonder myself too <laughs> you know what you know just because i have a lot of other follow-up questions but is it rather that you you're trying to like Provide a different angle as, as an ordering mechanism, what we are seeing. Because your last slide, literally, the financialization of space or space, uh, how you called it, mm -hmm. was a lot of keywords, spaces of definancialization, a lot of keywords, ideas, but also programs to a certain extent that are very well linked with the degrowth movement. I mean, it's it's not super new, they just, you know. Um, outline it in a different way. So that would be my first question. And then later on, I ask my second question. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sabrina, for the nice words and the difficult question. Well, the why question I, I, I asked many times after I sent in the abstract, I was like, oh, why did I do that? <laughs> um, but sometimes it's it's good to, in a way, to get out of your comfort zone. Um, I mean, I could do another paper on housing and financialization, and I probably will. Um, <laughs> something else as well. Um, so I've always been fascinated by this idea of the colonization of the life of Habermas. Um, and I've used it a little bit uh, when I was talking about credit scoring in the past. I relied on it a little bit quite loosely without getting into all the details. So yes, I wanted to provide a different angle. And it's partly to what I said on one of the first slides about this debate of financialization. I feel it being a little bit stuck. I don't know if this is the answer, uh, but maybe it's possible to, to rethink it from a different literature. I think also there's now such a reliance on post-structuralist ideas that it's sometimes I find it very difficult after post-structuralism what to do with it next. I feel there's a lot of uh, deconstruction and not always a lot of reconstruction. And what I appreciate very much in the work of people like Bourdieu, Habermas, Giddens, is that there's always a critical interrogation but then there's a reconstruction. Um, and I see that also in, in Hart and Negri's work, uh, so they're not alone, but I find that often much more difficult in this post-structuralist theories where I agree with the critiques and then I'm often a little bit left, what now? So it's not necessarily that I wanted to talk about this in detail and advocate this from a Habermasian perspective. 
this is partly me being a little bit cheeky because of the title of the of the Spring Academy. I felt like why well, I talk so much about this that I wanted to talk about a little bit about this at least at the end. Also because it, it might be slightly less depressing to end with this. Um, although also to connect a little bit to this idea from from Habermas and to yeah to relate it to to these ideas of Polanyi and other people where I think there's more inspiration we can find in other places. I think at some point you see everyone running in one direction and then everyone's like, oh, we have to look at Spalani. Well, actually, if you look at Spalani, there's not that much he talks about, about the re-embedding. It's, it's relatively little in his work. Habermas talks much more about it. So that would be another reason. I really like Polanyi too, but this for me would be a reason to, to do a little bit of this. But yeah, I'm not necessarily an expert on, on many of these things. I know there's, there's other people in the room who are a bigger expert uh, on these issues. Um, so yeah, a different angle, um, a little bit to um, with Habermas in a different light. Um, yeah, and for myself to to have some you know, some new ideas about how to think about financialization, and then hopefully for other people too. Is it enough? <laughs> There's a beer waiting later on, perhaps you know. So. <laughs> for me, hopefully. <laughs> Line up again. So, but Andreas, no. Yeah, thank you. Maybe people who ask question could shortly say the, their names and uh, the institutions come from. Uh, okay, yeah, I'm Andreas Kubert. I'm working here on the floor. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, thank you. Uh, fascinating stuff. I have one question and one provocation. Uh, I mean, firstly, that's, that's all great. I buy it, uh, everything. It's, it's uh, super. But um, so the, the question being on uh, temporality. I mean, colonization is a process, so there must be uh, not only a spatial, but also a temporal dimension in it. And uh, I wonder what you think about that. Is it going quicker? Is it um, going slower? Is, are there forces synchronizing in space uh, or uh, something like that? Um, so what, what's the role on, on temporality? Uh, and the provocation, actually your, your very last uh, bullet point, um, uh, sort of like uh, triggered that in, in me and uh, going back here to your paradigms, right? So bureaucracy and, and uh, uh, McDonald's and uh, network and so on. Um, so my uh, really friendly provocative question about um, that would be, is a real, like the, the next paradigm maybe? So if, is that actually the past? And is the uh, the digital take like the digital colonization the the thing uh, going on right now and and rather the future? Okay, um, the temporal dimension. Um, is it going slower or quicker? I'm I'm not sure. I think also maybe both at the same time. It depends because it comes in many different shapes. <laughs> um, is there a synchronization in space? some extent because we see some of these processes rolling out in different places quite similarly sometimes being copied sometimes developing uh, seemingly in the, uh, isolation from each other so i would say to some extent yes there is a synchronization in space but at the same time there's continued uneven development sometimes furthered by financialization so yeah it's, it's not possible to give a yes or a no i think so, and so some extent, yes, to some extent, maybe the opposite even happening. Um, also because you could say finance, sort of formal finance hasn't seeped into everywhere. Um, and you could say, well, maybe the state bureaucracy hasn't seeped into everything either. It probably is already a little bit deeper, but that might be also a matter of time. So another temporal dimension, maybe colonization of finance in the way that it's happening um, has been accelerated in, in recent decades, but yeah, has been ongoing in that sense for less time than the bureaucracy or the capitalist system, to use these big terms. Then about the paradigm, I, I thought about also putting something in there about the digital or artificial intelligence and things like that. And I thought it was interesting, of course, Castell's work about the network, you could say, discusses some of these things already, but not everything. But um, I would say that a lot of these things from the digital and, and whatever you want to call them, um, in a way, are also subject to these financialized rationalities and logics. So I think there's two ways to see it, and the one isn't right and the other one isn't wrong. You could say that the financial is a necessary condition for the digital. You could also say 
that the digital, these non-human technologies, as Richard calls them, are a dimension of financialization. Um, and yeah, I mean, in my story, it makes more sense to, to tell it in, in one way than in the other way, but I don't think the other thing is necessarily wrong. Uh, I think it's it's healthy that paradigms compete. I think it's healthy that there's more than one paradigm. Um, so yeah, I think if you go to the natural sciences, you often have one paradigm. In the social sciences, almost by definition, you do not. So I'd be happy for these to be not competing paradigms, but co-evolving paradigms that really have something to say about each other as well. And I'm, I'm quite comfortable with not having to defend one over the other one in that sense. Oh, I think we can collect three questions now in a row. Would that be okay? So I think we will first Oliver, Sand, and Desiree. Thank you, Romana from Polytechnico and Turismo. Oh, sorry. Um, thank you for the great presentation and for giving us new perspective on this study. And I was just uh, curious about what you mean by the financialization of the discourse. <laughs> And uh, like how it's linked with the work of this thing that you mentioned just at the beginning, like the innovative role of language. I don't know, just if you can say a bit more about that, uh, which I found very interesting. Hey, um, uh, thank you. Um, Oliver Ebert, um, I'm director of the IRS. Um, so what I what I do understand well is that you, in a sense, reframe the process of financialization as something that Habermas has called the colonization of the life world by the system. And you could also proceed and say finance is one of the ways <laughs> the life world is colonized by the system. Um, and I even would say that what you what you call spaces of um, definancialization, so the resistance against financialization in the life world, might even be part of this process, right? So because colonization is also something a contested thing, so there is also some you know, contestation and some counterforce. I don't understand is how the system could be colonized by finance. Um, this does not really, you know, this, is, this does not really fit to the to the whole model of, of Habermas. So, where is is there a super system colonizing the system, or is the life world counter colonizing the system? So, I, I don't really understand this this uh, intellectual move. <clears throat> <laughs> I know. Uh, Desiree Fields, um, I'm based at UC Berkeley, and I actually wanted to go back to the first two questions, um, just because I wanted to hear you talk a little bit more about them, because like, uh, sorry, I forget your name, Oliver? Andreas, Andreas sorry. <laughs> Andreas was mentioning, oh, this could also work for tech, and as you were talking, I was kind of going through and thinking like, okay, the redefinition of citizens to consumers could be the redefinition of citizens to users the financialization or the platformization of daily life and so on and so forth, right? So I think we could kind of swap in terms related mm -hmm. to tech and, and make a very similar argument. Um, so I guess I wanted to hear you talk a little bit more about, and you said, yes, we can have competing paradigms, that's great. But could you say more about what is specific here to finance that makes it so that we can't you know, swap in platformization, right? Um, and then you said that you kind of, you know, started with this idea that, um, that the kind of conceptual debates around financialization are maybe a little bit stale or haven't, you didn't say that, haven't advanced very much recently. Um, could you say more specifically what this perspective does to advance conceptualizations of, of financialization, right? So I see that you're trying to add something, but what does that addition do? Yeah. Okay. No, in 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to the question in the back. Um, financialization is a discourse. Yeah, I put it back up here again. I'm, I'm not a, a knowledgeable on Wittgenstein's work myself. So I just refer to Wittgenstein as Habermas relying for one specific part of his theory on Wittgenstein. 
So I won't be saying much of Wittgenstein. But what I think is here is important is what it says between brackets here. Finance is a language to assess all things economic and non-economic. So to use financial, financial terms, financial rationality, financial instruments to assess things in life, uh, education, healthcare, food, uh, but also different sectors of the economy to reduce them to their financial elements. Um, and I'll keep this short and I'll go directly to Oliver's question about how the system could be colonized. Well, again, I think that the important part is at least to a large extent in the state that there's a certain rationality in the state that is being changed through a financial rationality. Whereas in Habermas's theory, the state in a way has quite, to some extent, quite its own rationality. Yes, it's supporting the capitalist system, but it has a rationality on its own that has a different way of functioning than in the capitalist economy. There are two forms of rationality. They're both formal rationality, instrumental rationality, but the instrumental rationality of the state to Habermas is not the same as to the market. I would say that the instrumental rationality of finance is already a narrow, narrower version of that of the capitalist economy, but it comes out of it, just like the system comes out of the life world, we could say the financial system is part of the capitalist system. It's always been fundamental to it. Um, but this financial instrumentality has always been an important one in businesses. But if we see the whole discussions, for instance, about um, shareholder value, it is clear that for large corporations, shareholder value, in a way, a, a financialized rationality, is taken over in how companies are being run. It's quite a bit of, of discussion of it, um, but a lot of it is, is evidence supporting the claim often with some, you know, some things that are a little bit different than other people have claimed, but by and large, a lot of the literature would support that claim. I would say that a lot of the literature on the financialization of the state supports the claim also that financial instruments are becoming more important in City Hall rather than simply relying on financial markets, borrowing money, money there and spending it. It's the way states are being evaluated has become much more financialized in the rating systems, but also the way that the state works itself relying on financial instruments, sometimes inventing new financial instruments. And I mentioned Brazil and China before. Those are also countries where some of these instruments are being newly invented, not just in the US, where some of the earlier examples came from, often at the city level. So Chicago used to be an important one in the literature, but I would say uh, Sao Paulo, uh, Chongqing are other important cities where new financial instruments are being introduced by the state using, in a way, the financial sector to its own uh, to its own advantage, uh, and therefore, um, yeah, you could say this is my twist to Habermas. That's why I said in the beginning I'm not just doing a full Habermasian approach. I borrow from Habermas to make my own point, not to say this is what Habermas would argue. I mean, he's still alive, so he could argue it himself. Uh, he's arguing other things right now, uh, some of them about social media. Um, but um, yeah, so this is my way of saying departing from from Habermas. It's also why there's always these references to Polanyi, to Lefebvre, to Giddens, also to say like, okay, for me, it's not Habermas all the way. It's just to position Habermas in a larger debate. And then for me, how I can use that. Then to Desiree's questions, these might be the most difficult ones. What is specific to finance? I think some of it is what I just said to the response to the other two, two questions about what's specific to finance. It's very hard to pinpoint it in a way and say like, this is different from other developments, maybe because finance is the rationality is, seep, is seeping so deep into other parts of the life of the system that it becomes more and more difficult also to separate what is purely financial. Um, and I think very often the financial and the digital may also come together. Uh, I, I know that I'm going to have to be more precise when I write this down, but if there's any suggestions from you or from other people, I'd be, be very happy to do this. This, this is by far the, the first, you know, this is really the first and uh, first the first draft of, of what I hope to write. There isn't much more than the PowerPoint right now. Um, so what is it in addition to? I would say it is in addition to other conceptualizations of financialization that rely on different kinds of literatures that I would say don't give you the view that an, a more Habermasian take gives you. Um, also by connecting in a way the different strands of the financialization. I think what happens in this literature, as happens in other literatures, as the literature grows, is that you get more specialization. 
Uh, and I think at the beginning, this dialogue function of the financialization literature was important. And as I was saying, there are still people who make the connections, but I think a lot of papers are much more specific now. This is a contribution to the financialization of the state. This is a contribution to the financialization of housing. This is about daily life. And people might combine two things saying, oh, it's about daily life and housing. Or they say it might be about, uh, you know, um, large corporations and um, a specific sector of the economy. But to actually connect these different trends in a more conceptual way, I think is difficult. And to do that in a way to, on the one hand, show how they're similar, but on the other hand, also to make a distinction. I think the financialization, the colonization of finance in the life world has different effects in the system. I think these are not exactly the same things. And so to suggest that all these things are the same, which I'm not saying the literature does, but sometimes it's not being discussed, so you would almost assume that, would be too narrow. But also to say that they're completely disconnected, I think, would be, would be too narrow. So for me, there are two things that are related. But um, the term colonization and life of the system helped me to reinterpret how this is happening. Uh, help me to see that what is happening to households is not the same as what is happening to the state. That these are qualitatively different domains. Uh, where, both, where finance has an influence on both, and there's some parallels there, but there's also important differences. And that also some of the financialization of the life world, of course, happens still through the state and still to the capitalist economy because the financial sector isn't, isn't separate from this. So talking about the financialization of the state is still something qualitatively different than the financialization of daily life, but they are connected in some way. And I think the language here allows me to see these connections in a, in a different way. Um, yeah, thinking out loud mostly rather than having completely far through. Yeah. Since we started 10 minutes later, <laughs> another 10 minutes, which- uh, We didn't need that beer soon though. Uh, <laughs> so, but I think we have, just another round of three questions, and I know that both Gergel and Alberto, right, yeah. had their hands up already. So I would also include Luisa. Sorry, <laughs> but at least there's women's <laughs> gender. <laughs> and let me see. I mean, if you can take all these three questions and respond in two minutes, we have another round. <laughs> no, it's in my interest not to be too short. Okay. <laughs> We start with Gergen and then we move from the left to the right side of the room. Uh, hi, I'm Gergen, I'm Gergen Oud from uh, Budapest Center for Social Sciences. Uh, about just the last slide, it seemed uh, from this that uh, the concept uh, of definancialization is that someone is, you know, fighting against it uh, and and tries to give alternatives. But what we see. Well, the two examples uh, always coming up in my mind is one way, uh, one example is Hungary and the other is Turkey, where you see that uh, political power is being kept. And then it's not the, 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 the politics and what is happening is not really subsumed to this financial logic. So inflation is uh, on the run and um, you know, interest rates are high and risks are considered very high. And still political power is, yeah. well, be very negative, it seems that the Turkish president could keep his uh, power too. And then uh, we see this, this thing in Hungary. So I just want to say that it's not something like, you know, a conscious fight, but it's just not subsuming and still keeping. Yeah. Uh, many thanks, uh, Professor, for your lecture. Um, I found it, I found it very inspiring, uh, also because of the idea of of connecting these two concepts. But uh, adding something on the, on the on colonization, uh, I was wondering, uh, in in your opinion, this like this concept of colonization of finance interacts with the concept of hegemony, cultural hegemony, uh, conceptualized by Antonio Gramsci. Because um, in my view, um, like if if we uh, tackle the, the issue from the angle of uh, uh, real estate, for instance, is, uh, the side that 
I know more. Uh, we, we can say that, the, the, for instance, the real estate is conceived as a golden power from uh, several states, especially Asia, uh, when they're established like sovereign funds or, or special trusts. And uh, in a way, uh, financialization can be seen as a form of uh, cultural hegemony that, that can be uh, reflected like other schemes by which uh, financialization was established like uh, from the American and Anglo-Saxon system. So yeah, many thanks. Lisa. Uh, yeah, so thank you for your lecture. <laughs> I am. Uh, and yeah, well, <laughs> my question would be, um, yeah, how could you assess or characterize the final financialization of other economies, no? Which, uh, yeah, features would you give of this financial logic? How would you look in this, in this alternatives? How you would how you would come about to do this alternative? No, no. How could you how could you uh, characterize the financialization of these other economies? Which elements would they have? You know what? What, what do you mean with these other economies? Yeah, you you point out that uh, sharing economy or alternatives are also being financial. Yeah. Like yeah. put in this financial logic. Uh, how would what what do you mean by that? How would you mm -hmm. characterize okay. that? Yeah, I'll, I'll maybe I'll start with the last one, and you correct me if I misunderstood the question. Um, well, I think if you look at Airbnb, that's that's an example of the sharing economy that's in a way just started by people joining joining forces and just saying, okay, I have a mattress or I have a, a futon, and futons were still very popular. That people could just sleep on, um, and then in a way it becomes a model that becomes something to to be copied. We were just talking before about the, the the white bike scheme that there used to be in Amsterdam in the 70s, where some local activists just put white bikes throughout the city. Um, so that was very much about a sharing economy. It was about shared transport. And you could say now we have all these bike share schemes and we have all those uh, electric scooters and that's become a business model. So this is one way in which you could say uh, the corporate sector takes over some of these ideas that, that start as counter, uh, that start as alternatives to it. Um, so you can or you can try to ring fence an alternative to financialized capitalism or to capitalism more generally at the organizational level and say we're going to protect our institution not to become financialized by having something in the principles of the organization. But it doesn't mean that. The idea can't be copied and then be taken over by a capitalist or financialist institution. So that's we've seen also with the, the microcredit, for instance, and that this was also something that started in a way, I wouldn't say completely bottom up, but starting uh, in as a good idea, as a good project, and then becomes something that becomes a money making machine. So being subsumed uh, in the hard and naked sense rather than in the purely Marxist sense. Um, so I think at the organizational level, of, of doing this, you can have your own organization and make sure it doesn't happen. But it's very difficult to protect uh, the idea itself from this not happening because very often the idea is open and anyone can just do that, which has become very clear with with Uber and, uh, and Airbnb, but yeah, with the micro credits too. Um, so then, let's see. Maybe let's go to get a guess question. Then I think it's it's a very good point, and I'll try to generalize it even more and say. And the definitization for me here, as you said, comes from the life rule, but it could come from the system itself. Maybe that's a way to, in a way, uh, abstract a little bit from how you put it. And that's, I think, one element of it, that the state has a capacity also to do this. I think even within the capitalist economy, there are resistances to some of these financialized logics. There are companies resisting this logic and they don't want to be part of it. That doesn't mean they're fully out of the capitalist economy. There's banks who make very deliberate choices that they don't want to do it, despite the fact that there are financial institutions. So even there, there's some possibility. So maybe I should add something about the possibilities there. But then if we talk about Hungary and Turkey, there's also a backlash there, which is, again, for instance, how Turkey is being evaluated in financial markets. They can't fully escape um, by definancializing. There is a different financialized logic that still goes on because in a way Turkey doesn't control it. 
and Turkey being uh, downgraded by some of these, these rating agencies means that they can't fully escape this logic. Uh, I'm not saying that it's not possible at all to fully escape it, but that they are still dependent on the financial markets. Not escape, I just said that escape was that they could keep power. Yeah. Uh, and then Alberto, um, I'm, I'm not an expert on hegemony either, but I think some of the ideas of hegemony for me resonate more with this idea of the discourse of finance also becoming very dominant. Uh, I know this is one very specific take on hegemony to, to see it in that way. Um, I couldn't follow you completely on the link between cultural hegemony and real estate. I mean, um, like... It, it could be argued that maybe some uh, uh, ways and tools used in finance coming from like uh, diverse states uh, could be seen as uh, like levers for entering the market for an empowerment of like a national system. Yeah. Uh, so in this sense, of course, there is also a, a cultural structure in like uh, shaping uh, such instruments, such financial instruments yeah. in real estate and using real estate as like a, a way for empowering the local economy and like count more worldwide also in the logics of, of states. That's why I was linking it to, uh, to hegemony. Yeah. Well, what I'm thinking <laughs> that is that it uh, iterates the idea that for me, finance doesn't come from one particular place. Yes, it's being rolled out to some extent. Uh, but it doesn't mean that everything is exactly the same way. So the sovereign wealth funds you mentioned, and some of them being really big real estate funds at the same time, um, they, they might have their own, their own origin of their financial logics, their real estate logics. Um, but I think I will, I will stay clear of Gramsci. I think there's already too much, too much in that one. And in Gramsci, is just <laughs> going to make it too difficult, at least for me, myself. Look at the watch. Basically, I think the time has run out and we should uh, relieve and run away. Thank you very much. <laughs> also take the chance to continue that conversation in a more convenient uh, environment over the next few days. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions and a lot of discussions. So I would to, like to thank Manuel very much for this um, Thank you for being here, asking these questions and Let's give Manuel an applause.